almost like to find out what, what works. And, and uh, so I've, I've accumulated um, a, a small handful of helpful reminders. And these are things that I need to hear over and over again. <laughs> so uh, I find that if, you know, if repetition is a good thing, then I, I need the repetition. So I, I think we're probably all in the same boat. So I have a few quotes that I, that I want to share that are some of my favorites. And, and uh, uh, I, I was telling Craig on the way over that uh, what prompted a good part of what's toward the latter end of this, this segment is uh, uh, years of going through and putting little smiley faces in the margins of my, my uh, you know, dog-eared book. Because I think there's an enormous sense of humor to the course. And, and it basically is a reminder that if we don't take our dream projections quite so seriously, we can afford to lighten up a little bit and, and, uh, and see the, the, the levity and the humor that really is there. And, uh, so that's going to be the, the backdrop for this. So I'm, I'm going to read the uh, quote here. This is actually lesson, lesson two. This, this is actually from a previous presentation, but I just seem to fit. So I've given everything I see in this room, on the street, from this window, in this place, all the meaning that it has so once again, thank you all for being here, and I want to thank Cheryl and and, Dove and, and Barrett and Craig for the projector and, and so many others, countless others for for uh, uh, so many contributions. And uh, also like to you know a, a nod to the Foundation for Inner Peace and the Foundation for a Course in Miracles. And and for those of you who might be newer to the course, these are two websites that are just amazingly uh, loaded with incredible resources for. Uh, you know, deepening your study. And, uh, and then the next thanks is to a lady named Claire Kulikowski, who uh, I had gone to a, 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 a I was house sitting for her about um, 2007, I guess it was. And uh, uh, she was going to Hawaii for a week and a half. And I thought, well, I could house sit because I was working big. And I was living in Eagle Point, Oregon. And most of my web clients were, which I was you know, still do, uh, were in Ashland, Oregon. And I thought, well, I could do a little house sitting for her. And uh, I thought, well, there's this movie that sounds interesting called Living Luminaries. And I knew of Marianne Williamson's work. And I knew of uh, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. I actually got to interview him a couple times on community radio in, in Nevada City. And, uh, on, you know, several other people, uh, Eckhart Tolle. But there's this Gary Renard guy that I hadn't heard of. And I kind of like what he had to say. And it's like, this is pretty good stuff. And there on her coffee table, uh, where I was planning to write my second book, you know, that week, because I was, you know, setting aside this time, were both of Gary's first two books. And I was like, I could not put them down. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what was going to be a, a book about um, sacred geometry, which is kind of what the first book was mostly about, and, and a lot of graphics, uh, ended up having that as a backdrop. And, uh, and these hermetic laws that I found, of, of which the first one's the law of mentalism that states that all is mental, everything is mind. Where have we heard something like that before? <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that, that basically totally changed what uh, the direction I took with that book that's in the back of the room there. And, uh, and you know, again, thanks to countless others, because the, the, the so-called others, there's no one else in the room, right? They're, we're all... We're looking at mirrors of each other, of ourselves, of the, the one spirit that we all share. And um, the shared interest, that's something that I, I found over and over again. Um, has, any, has anybody else gone through the journey through the series with uh, Kim Opnick, the journey through the, the uh, workbook, the manual, and now recently, more recently the text? Um, the one, the, 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 uh, the journey through the manual, he emphasizes two things that I think are really cool. One is the uh, importance of Trusting, where have we heard that before? <laughs> Trusting our inner kindness teacher, a.k.a. Holy Spirit, a.k.a. J or Jesus of the Course. And uh, allowing that to, to, you know, wash through us and become uh, not just a, um, a thing that we do once in a while, but a, a, a way of living and a way of looking at life. It's like, I, I can afford to trust that um, what I really need will be taken care of. And... Uh, and it you know, happens not necessarily on the level of form, but on the level of the mind again. And then sometimes the form works too, so just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing that, that he put in, in the, the uh, journey through the workbook I thought was really important was the, the shared interest. And that's, I think, the, the, the shared interest is, is uh, the sameness. That when seeing that we're all in the same boat, I think that's really what leads us from 
the the separation, the, the crazy notion of separation and, and separate interests, to the sameness that then is is an easier transition to the oneness that we can't really grok at this level. But uh, but the sameness is something that I think we can relate to with everyone. And and um, anyway, so I, f I find those two two key ideas in, in uh, Ken's journey through the work was really helpful: the trust in the Holy Spirit and the shared interest. So. And that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> um, well, for, for those of you who happen to be in the Denver area, uh, in more than just you know passing through, uh, Rocky Mountain Miracle Center, the bottom one, the rest I think I've already mentioned. I've got a, a blog on the Course in Miracles ACI blog. Um, but if you happen to be in the Denver area, Rocky Mountain Miracle Center has a lot of great classes. Uh, 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 Lynn Corona, Susan Dugan, um, Doug Sparks, who, who lives right down the hill in Boulder here, uh, gives workshops and classes, just wonderful. So I, I highly recommend all those uh, venues and things. So, but there's such, such great resources that we have now to, to uh, you know, give us opportunities to deepen our study and to, to let it wash through us and let it let kind of immerse ourselves in that and at, at a pace that's comfortable. You know? I, I like what, what David Hoffmeister said, shared. Uh, one of my favorite parts is, you know, don't fight yourself. And, and when the resistance happens, just, just say, okay, I chose to be afraid of love for a little bit, and that will pass. <laughs> this too shall pass. And when we remember to do that, we were not making a big deal about the resistance, and those things, then those resistances flow by much more quickly. And I think that's that's kind of what it seems like what we're all doing in, in different ways is is allowing the gap between when we notice um, the insane thought system, the ego, you know, trying to stake a, a flag in the territory of the mind and saying, uh, and the time it takes to, for us to say, uh-uh, and we're kind of shortening that distance a little, you know, that gap of a little more each time. So, so these, are, these are just kind of a, a quick set of reminders, you know. Uh, these, these should be very familiar. <laughs> Nothing real, what we all are, all of spirit, and a, another tip of the hat to, to Gary, in his fearless love audio, I, I love that idea that, that if we can just remember that when we look at each other, no matter who or what we're looking at, we're not looking at a piece of oneness. We're looking at all of oneness. We're looking at all of perfect innocence, perfect spirit, perfect completion. Um, the whole thing. <laughs> Your smile is so wonderful, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Way. But that's it, isn't it? I mean, it, that's the whole enchilada. That, that, that perfection that we all are is in every seeming part. And uh, what, what a great reminder. And, and when we find resistance to it, just say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be given opportunities in my forgiveness classroom to look at that again and again and again until it becomes an automatic habit, until I don't even have to think about it. And it just, just you yeah. know. So that's what we're all working on, I think. And then, of course, nothing unreal. The who we believe we are, ego's special dream of um, persona, you know, the, the, the dream of separation with its poster child body, you know, <laughs> that we have, that, that does, that's really a, a hallucination. Um, around one of the, the, the meal conversations uh, this weekend, I was reminded of, you remember see the magic eye posters, where you, you look past the, the seemingly random dots and, and blobs of, of ink? And, and then suddenly you see this three-dimensional shape appear. I think that's kind of like what we're doing with, with our forgiveness. We're not denying what our sensory data tells us. We're not saying that doesn't exist. And, and we acknowledge appropriately on the level of form what, what you know, is it makes sense to acknowledge and, and do the you know, right thing. But on the level of mind, where, it's, where that is only and always what the Course addresses is mind, and that's such an important reminder too. I have to, every time I open the book, it's like, oh yeah, this is all about the mind. It has nothing to do with <laughs> bodies or space or time or any of that stuff. And, and that's, I think that's so helpful. And that's where the peace of God is. You know, when we can get past the, the, the meaningless dots of, of the, the little Whoville life. Has anybody seen uh, Horton Hears a Who? The, the, the Dr. Seuss movie? I, I happened to watch that a, a few years ago and I was, I was struck with the idea. Here's this little speck of dust. And this elephant happens to be his ears just in the right place at the right time, and, and he hears this plaintive call from, from someone with a megaphone on a, on a little tiny planet on a speck of dust. And that's their whole world, you know? And, but isn't that a great metaphor for what 
we, where we think we are, you know, we, we think we're limited to this little tiny speck of dust and this little six foot, you know, roughly package in a, in a hundred year, if we take good care of it, you know, uh, time frame in the you know, backwaters of some obscure galaxy, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's just it's pretty silly, huh? I mean. <laughs> So these are reminders, again, that I, I need to hear. So that's why I put them together. So, and, and hopefully they will be helpful. Um, so th and there's really just two thought systems, and they're both dreams. The first one being ego, the belief in separation, separation which is a highly popular psychosis. <laughs> and and this, this is a phrase that Ken Robnick says he should have copyrighted it, but uh, I'm going to borrow it. I'll borrow it. I'll use it. It's a maladaptive solution to a non-existent problem. <laughs> And isn't that great? Because I mean, yeah. we're, we're trying to fix something, you know, that <laughs> we're, we're, we're fixing it, this thing on the screen here instead of looking at the projector and what's going into the projector, which, you know, once again, it's spark to the morn. <laughs> <laughs> to the morn. <laughs> so, um, and, and that thoughts, you know, the thoughts that restore awareness to the all encompassing oneness is, is uh, you know, that forgiveness process and that that awareness, and, and, and that's how we undo our ego. We don't really get rid of it, we just basically, another metaphor I, I'm finding useful lately is, you know, when you watch a DVD, and when they, on the setup they usually give you the director's cut, and you can turn that, the director's commentary on and off. Um, I think we came here with the ego's director's cut, you know, <laughs> locked on, but then if we, if, we, if we look carefully, we can find that there's actually a little toggle, and we can toggle it off, or at least turn the volume down on it, slowly but surely. <laughs> and that director's cut of the ego's blathering, on and on and on, and, you know, like Ken, Ken Robinick calls it the victim script, you know, and, and, uh, and everybody's got one, and, 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 but if we can catch it in mid-thought and say, do I really want to do this again? <laughs> and and to just say no, you know. And, and then, and, and, but that's all we have to do, you know. Has, has anybody seen the Bob Newhart uh, um, Stop It Therapy? You know? yeah. isn't, isn't that great, you know? Because it, it, it doesn't have to be a complicated thing. We just have, just have to stop it, you know. Just, you know. <laughs> just, just stop it, you know. And, but it, it's... Obviously, we need to be patient with ourselves when we're not in a frame of mind to stop it, you know. And, and uh, you know, kind of like the, the episode last night with uh, uh, the lady who came up. You know, when we're in the process of grieving, let ourselves do that. Let ourselves go through whatever's happening and not try to deny the experience, but allow the experience to be observed by that part of us, that the decision-making mind that can watch that and see where it's going, watch it play out, and, and you know, be, in a sense, kind of scientifically objective about it. And, and then see how that works for us, and then see how how we can actually shorten the amount of time that we leave that insane blathering director's cut of egos nonsense, you know, volume turned up, and you say, well, maybe I could turn it down a little sooner next time, just a little bit quicker, to to you know let it fade out rather than you know ten years, maybe uh, ten months or ten weeks or ten minutes. It's so simple, huh? <laughs> to, to, and that's how we're doing. We're transcending the duality. So there's a, a quote from Idria Shah in, in a class I took years ago. Um, Charlie Tart introduced me to this book. He said, a father said to his double-seeing son, son, you see two instead of one. How can that be, the boy replied. If I were, there would seem to be four moons up there in place of two. <laughs> So, of course, the miracles is a pure non-dual teaching, and so to return to our awareness, uh, to perfect oneness, we need to remove the blocks to that awareness, uh, which is our really our beliefs in the order of difficulty, and that's you know miracle principle number one. That, you know, some you know like I, I, I paraphrase or Orwell down here. You know, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. You know, well we do the same thing with illusions. We say well. I can deal with illusion A and illusion B, but illusion C, now that's a tough one. <laughs> you know? and don't, don't we all do it? You know? and, uh, but they're, they're all kind of on the same, the same battlefield of duality. And what the, uh, our beloved Blue Books, uh, now book, uh, suggests is that we could, you know, kind of like the Cheshire Cat, looking over the chessboard, you know, seeing all this, this crazy battling going on, and, and say to ourselves, I don't have to actually don the armor and, and get out there and fight. I can, I can kind of watch it, you know. And, and, even, and, and one of the characters may be the self that we think we are. 
but you can you can start watching it and see seeing it in a sort of a surreal, um, lucid dream kind of a thing. And I think that can be really helpful when you catch yourself and see those moments when when you're watching the contents of your mind and saying, "Oh, I could choose the piece instead of this." <laughs> you know, there's another way of of looking at the world. So. Separate individuals, minds, personas, bodies, galaxies, atoms, all that stuff. It's, it's basically an amazingly, well, beyond Academy Award winning, you know, 3D holographic movie that, that we are brilliantly producing, directing, choreographing, you know, all this stuff moment to moment to moment. And uh, what, an, what an amazing production. We all get, you know, the, the ultimate uh, award for, you know, that, that's why I think Jesus says in his course, you know, it's like, you know, I'm not going to diminish the, the, the uh, capability of your mind because you, you gave yourself the capacity to, to dream this whole thing up because you thought you needed to escape from a problem. There's that maladaptive solution to a non-existent problem. You, you thought that you threw God under the bus and, and need to feel horribly guilty for shattering perfect oneness, but it never happened. That's the, that's the cool part of it. It never happened. But we don't know that until we look at it. And that's the challenge, because we, we're all squeamish about, about, you know, having Toto pull the curtain back. You know, we, no, we don't want to go there, because you know, we don't want to see that it's just a funny little man pulling, you know, levers and moving knobs and stuff, you know. Because that, I mean, the game over flashes across the screen. <laughs> so this is one thing. That I, again, another kudos to, to Gary. Um, the, I like your shirt too, Gary. <laughs> um, the, 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 when I when I got first read to you, it was like I, I knew I kind of on, on some intuitive level knew that um, there was stuff in there about forgiveness. But then, with, then when you know our person was saying it's all about forgiveness, like the light bulb moment, you know, and going back and rereading, it's like how did I miss that? How did I, how could I possibly miss that it's all about forgiveness? And that's really. The simplicity of our curriculum. It's, it, that's, it's just about looking at the contents of our unconscious mind, bringing it back in, reeling it in, and seeing that it's that when we put it on the altar and let the Holy Spirit look at it with us, taking that metaphoric hand and say, let's look at this together. Because when we try to do it by ourselves, you know, we're basically clueless and, and we're gonna you know, we're gonna misinterpret it. But when we take that that inner kindness teacher's hand, um, we're gonna see that there's you know, it's 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 unconscious initially, but it's also unfounded. It's totally unfounded. The unconscious guilt is also unfounded guilt because nothing happened. But we don't see that until we look at it, and so that's why we have this elaborate, mathematically perfect classroom that we call 3D Live that gives us these opportunities to look at moment to moment exactly exactly what we need to to be. Uh, putting back into our mental machinery to do our forgiveness classroom work with. And, and we get exactly on a silver platter, you know, just the things that push our buttons or that <laughs> are, are our major, you know, uh, dark nights of the soul or, or, you know, irritations or whatever. But if we can remember to be grateful because without that, we would have no way of getting back to our mind. We would have no way of returning that mindful state where we can look at the contents of the mind and see that the separation, that whole idea was bogus. It was just a, a, silly, a silly idea. So anything less than all-encompassing pieces is a dream. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor. And I, I think it's kind of fun to turn, because the course is we've got everything backwards, upside down, inside out. And, and if we can realize that our dualistic world is, is inside out, upside down, and it's a fantasy. And we think that the abstract at, at, of the, the abstractions of the mind are, are metaphors, right? But in a sense, the, the matter, the, the seemingly solid, which is mostly empty space, whether it's a macroscopic or a microscopic scale, um, you know, if you go into a telescope or a, or a microscope, you're going to see ultimately that it's a whole, whole lot of nothing going on. Apologies to Jerry and Lewis, right? Um, so it's it's just it's just a giant colossal hologram made of nothing, and and what that's the metaphor. And our bodies are metaphors. They're they're walking symbols 
for an idea that somehow we were able to pull off this cosmic crime of shattering perfect oneness. But it never happened. That's, that's what, that's what you know, ego doesn't want us to hear. That's, that's what makes it tremble in its boots. Because if it never happened, then we're just fretting over nothing. So we forgive ourselves for what never happened. And, uh, and we forgive the alleged others by realizing our perceptions of them are our projections for what never happened. And that, I think, is so empowering and, and so it's challenging at times because it's so easy to think that other people are doing stuff to us. But we're, we're basically um, get in a feedback system. And we conveniently, we... we <laughs> We, we take the, the, the eraser on the whiteboard and we, we erase the, the cause uh, arrow that basically is the mind that's projecting this out. And all we see in our dream awareness is the, the feedback loop, the, the return arrow of the sensory data that comes back to us and we think that's doing it to us. But we're, we're not at the effect of it. Another, another word that, that's, that's come to mind lately that I think is kind of fun, and it's all through the course if you look for it, is the word mercy. And I think there's, again, the two thought systems. We're either at the mercy of the ego, which, of course, is pretty maladaptive, <laughs> or we're merciful by choosing the Holy Spirit's thought system. And when we're merciful to ourselves, we're merciful to each other, and vice versa. Because we let other people off the hook for what they never did. And that's fun. That's really fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, another favorite quote, this one's from Your Marble Reality. A successful relationship and everything we do in this world, seemingly world, <laughs> is a relationship of one sort or, no, or sort or another, not just our romantic or, or, or primary relationships. A successful relationship is one where you're forgiving or have forgiven the other person. That's pretty cool. Huh? Uh, this is, uh, I, I wasn't going to talk too much about physics, but here's one quote that I really like that I think is, is Profound. This is from John Wheeler, uh, who said, "There's no out there out there." <laughs> and tying right into that is uh, from Workbook Lesson 132. There is no world. This is the central thought the course attempts to teach. So you put those together, and you know the ancient mysticism and, and uh, uh, the modern physics and the Course in Miracles all converge in this this uh, wonderful uh, revelation. That's like, oh, all I have to do is. Change thought systems. Choose teacher. Choose, choose a different teacher. So the ego speaks first is always wrong, which is its hidden agenda, of course, is a not knowing. We're going to talk about not knowing in a second. Which is the denial of truth. Um, and another thing that, that I, I like that Ken Wapnick says a lot is, is it's, it's not a course in yes. We're actually uh, in a course in not no. So we're basically denying the denial of truth. So here, here's a little... Uh, thing I found on the net that I've been sharing a lot in the last year or so. A linguistics professor was lecturing to his class one day. In English, he said, a double negative forms a positive. In some languages, though, such as Russian, a double negative is still a negative. However, he pointed out, there is no language wherein a double positive can form a negative. A voice from the back, room, back of the room piped up. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> I, I like wordplay, so if you don't have to know my sense of humor, it's, it's right in line. So, the, another, I like mnemonic devices too, and I, I think one of the, the, the ones that just stuck with me is the three R's. And, and really, the, and as the course suggests, we only have to get involved and, and be willing to just kind of get the, the process going with the first two. And the first one is to reveal, to reveal when, to ourselves. When we've, um, you know, trusted in Lucy again to, to hold the football in place, or or the used car salesman and, and who's, who's selling us another lemon, you know, whatever metaphor you like, and and see that, okay, it didn't work before, it probably isn't going to work again, you know, and that that inner kindness teacher prompting is it always comes back and says, so how's that ego thought system working out for you? you know? <laughs> And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to reveal to ourselves that that, that strategy hasn't been terribly effective, you know. But, uh, so that's the first step, is that you know, we reveal that we've, you know, taken the hand of the wrong teacher. 
and, and there's no, no shame or guilt associated with that if we're, if we're willing to look at it and bring it to the altar of the mind with that, the, the teacher that does know the right stuff. And then um, with a little prompting, we can pry our white knuckled grip off of that thought system <laughs> and release it, right? <laughs> and we can just kind of, you know, finger by finger, maybe it takes a few years or lifetimes or whatever, it doesn't matter, we'll get there, right? <laughs> but, but we need to release our investment in that, that identity that isn't working for us. And that identity is just a fake identity. That's the little Whoville speck that Horton heard, you know, and the little dust speck floating by. And then the third step, which is automatic because we don't have to do anything to make perfect oneness perfect. It, it doesn't require involvement. I've got a quote here coming up that, that, that is my, one of my favorites that ties into that. Is the replacement. When we, when we do the double negative, we say not no, we deny ego's denial of truth, then what's left is the truth. That's so easy. <laughs> okay. And that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> um, yeah, we, the ego always wants to maintain the specifics, the special love, the special hate. Uh, the, and we, the, the, the strategy is, is it's outside of my jurisdiction. So as long as it's somebody else is doing it to me, then, then, you know, w then we can justify the victim script and, and, and keep it you know, intact. So when we reveal that, that you know, we did actually invest in that, and now the second step, the release, releasing the second R, we can release that identity investment in the specifics and see that it's really insanely masochistic. And why would we want to do that to ourselves? And we're making the specifics real and, and holding on to a victim identity, which, which uh, we don't really want at some point. You know, if we, if we are honest with ourselves and see how that's working out for us, we can say, you know, maybe that isn't working out so great. And then the replacement just happens automatically. I, another another phrase that, that uh, is another Ken phrase I like a lot. And I think this is really, it, it helps to let ourselves and everyone else off the hook. And he says, the ego is not sinful or evil or wicked. It's just silly. It's just silly. And, and that, I think that's really, it's really uh, a, a refreshing way to look at it, you know, because it's, from above the battleground, when we look at it, we see that there's nothing to it. It's just, it's just vaporware. It's just vacuous nothing that we've made a big deal out of. So I, I, I like to think about the, 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 the tyranny of specialness. And, if, and special love, you, you think of infatuation, right? So, so when we want to blame someone else, isn't that kind of the, the, the opposite of special hate? That's we insinuate something, right? <laughs> so, are you insinuating something here? <laughs> so, so the, it, our specialness is polarizing. When, when we make a big deal out of any specific thing, and, and wow, that just that, what a classroom that is, because it's, we could watch the subtle attempts of our ego to, to latch on to special people and special things and make big deals out of this and yada, yada, yada. And, and wow, it's amazing to watch that. But then over time, let go of that need to, to make this, those special things special. I, I like the church lady. For, this is my, my mentor. Why isn't that special? You know? So if I can remember to hear that little voice, you know, well, that special? I mean, a big deal out of stuff, you know? <laughs> And, and, and what's left over is, is that perfect peace when we can, can see that the specialness isn't getting us anywhere. And it's, it's really an infinitely inclusive innocence. And, and that's another thing that's it's incredibly challenging because we want to make special hate targets out of you know, a certain religion or a certain political persuasion or a certain country or ethnic group or gender, you know, on and on. You pick anything that's polar, anything in this thing that can be in the we-they category. And wow, it's so easy to, to you know, slide into that. Unless over time, again, we practice the, the mindful, lucid cultivation of the, the, uh, the practice of seeing when we start to do that and say, oh, I don't have to go there. <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to be a big production. It can just be a gentle awareness that says, wow, I was starting to make this special and I don't need to do that because that basically maintains the belief and separation from myself and this other person or this other group or this other whatever. And that is free.
since we're here to, this weekend to, to talk about freedom, right? So, and we never left it, except in dreams. So, we, we, we think we, we threw God under the bus, which is silly. It's an impossible crime that we, we really didn't commit. And it's just silly. It's just silly. Um, so, the purpose of illusions is to keep us mindless and, and not to undo the dream of separation. And that's another thing that in, in a number of Ken Lopnick's audios, he, he talks about that, you know, the Eastern mysticism gave us the idea that, that, um, that this dream is an illusion. But if you just stop there, kind of like if you, if, and the, another favorite section in, in the text, uh, in the chapter 31, that, that the, 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 the real alternative, you know, it's, it's kind of like it, it says, you know, perhaps you'd like to try all the different options to reality first, you know. You'd like to go down all the roads, you know. You know, be the first kid on your block to try all the, the, the alternatives that don't work. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, sometimes those bucket lists are kind of like that, you know. It's just like, well, I haven't tried this. I know it's not work, but I haven't tried this. <laughs> But, but you know, but the, but if you if you just stop there with the illusion being illusion, you know that's depressing because we because that's basically still thinking that the nothing is going to do it for us. But beyond the nothing, the release phase of that those three R's is letting the everything of the Holy Spirit's real identity take over and replace the the fraudulent idea that really. And we were talking. One of the conversations here this weekend was about unworthiness, you know. And how could how could the ego, the self that we think we are, ever be worthy if it's nothing? How could <laughs> how could nothing be something? <laughs> but but so the I think what a course in miracles does is it adds the purpose of nature of the ego, and but then the, the equally uh, you know the insane purpose, and then and the, but the same purpose of the Holy Spirit is to see that. Not only is the nothingness um, silly, but it had no effect, and it could not have possibly damaged the perfection that we all are, which is the everything. But we're so far down the rabbit hole, most of the time we don't see that. We, we, we think that, you know, we shatter this perfection, and, and as, as egos, of course we'd be terrified to let go of that. And so that's, you know, I think that's why that, that uh, fifth stage in the development of trust where it says, you know, it starts out and says, this could take a really long time. You know? <laughs> but, then, but then at the end of the paragraph, it's, it says, but we're not each step so heavily reinforced. Because every moment we have this magical, well, not in course jargon, but wonderful, let's, let's change the adjective, this wonderful capacity to, to be in touch with our feelings. And, and, and uh, Marie was talking about that just this morning, you know, to, to, to let those feelings uh, be part of what we observe, and, and then that's our indicator that when something's tilt, and we can we can get off the tilt really quickly by seeing that eh, something's out of balance, and then that change the thought. We can change the thought system. So it's a it's a decision making mind that really, that three parts that we all have. That's just why we're all the same. We all have the same decision making faculty that chooses between. An insane thought system and a sane thought system. And uh, okay, so here, here's a, another another quote that uh, I'll read the bottom one first. Trust not your good intentions; they're not enough. Because <laughs> because if we if we have the intent, kind of like Einstein's thing of you know if we're trying to solve the problem at the same level it was made. In other words, if we try to to, to defeat ego with an ego, well, first of all, the ego doesn't need to be defeated because it's not there, you know. But we don't see that unless we take the the inner kindness teacher's hand and, and move that those thoughts onto the altar, close encounters, beam of light down on it, and and uh, you know that that blazing awareness that says there's nothing there, but you you gotta move it to the altar of the mind first, and and you know with gratitude we see. Yeah, there was nothing to fret over. There really wasn't anything there. Uh, here's a quote. We often fall prey to the ego's clever strategy of concealing from us the true nature of the problem and its source. Simply put, the problem is not our perceived problems in the world and body, but the fact that we think we have a problem. Ideas don't leave their source. Um, I'm going to skip over. I'm the one that has to forgive me. Isn't that a great one? Okay, so here's another one. When we accept the Holy Spirit's purpose, forgiveness for our lives, 
uh, we gently grow up to the ideal of always being peaceful no matter what is going on in our personal worlds or the world at large. That is the meaning of liberty in the Course, being free to the ego's tyrannical domination of our thinking, which is the source of all suffering and fear. All of our fears and doubts about our lives and the world are shadows of what is really going on in our minds, as the world is but the outside picture of an inward condition. And that's from the Frequently Asked Questions of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles website, which has got 1,300 plus gems. If you haven't read them, I, I started reading through them sequentially after skipping around for years, and just a lot of brilliant stuff there, just all, all gems. I think I'm in the, the Will Rogers School of Ken and Gary. <laughs> I've never met anything that, that they've done that I don't like. <laughs> and that's certainly true of the FACIM website, too. Um, so again, the, you know, the, the specialness of, of the ego, it's 100% insane. We, we use our special, our special identity to maintain the belief in separation and our special relationships to, to keep that intact. But the 100% the sane alternative is to use that exact same classroom, the exact same script, but then we bring it up to a different level above the battleground and see it, how this is, can be used to bring it back to our mind for the healing of the contents of our mind by seeing that this is not something apart from me. This is my own mind. And if it's not eternally true, I don't have to sweat the program because it's that's something I can forgive and it will disappear. You know? Not a single note. Heaven's song was missed, right? Yeah. Isn't that great? Uh, I'm going to skip over this one. <laughs> I've got a bunch of slides. Um, yeah, so, so level confusion is another one. We, you know, we, we, we get so engrossed in trying to fix the dream. That, that's why um, earlier today, I think it was in the roundtables, which were wonderful. Thanks for that, Dove. That's such a great exercise in everyone. Um, one of the, the things that I, I was reminded of is that I, I'm sort of like a, I was going to bring a hat that says recovering dream repair technician. <laughs> you know, because I think we're all trying to fix the dream. And that's, that's the level confusion. We're, we're all trying to, you know, repair what's on the screen, you know? And, and you know, we duct tape and a little spray paint. And, and then and when, after you spray paint, it's like, well, you know, I go to the next slide and well, now it's different, you know? So you know, we, we keep trying to change the effect rather than dealing with the cause. Looking at the unconscious guilt, which is unfounded. That unfounded, I think, is such an important adjective to add to the unconscious guilt. So another, another thing that's mentioned briefly in, in uh, uh, about the bottom of the page of, of Lesson 136 is the double shield of oblivion. I think this is a really cool concept because it suggests that, that uh, the entire outer world, and, and I think individual individuality, space, and time are, are key ideas in that, to, to tell when we've identified with ego's insane strategy, if we're identifying with our individuality or you know, some, some isolated separate piece of, of, of you know, even, even in the dream, we can pretty much figure that we're playing into that, 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 that uh, deck, that card hand. <laughs> and space and time, that covers a lot of ground. So anything having to do with space or time, making big deals of space or time, um, that covers a fair amount of ground, doesn't it? <laughs> As, and, then, and then the inner shield is, is not just guilt, but it's the whole sin, guilt, fear, death, you know, victimhood, martyrdom, you know, insane paradigm that is, you know, the whole ego's package. And that's, that's what's behind the curtain that Toto pulls back, you know, that when we take the hand of our inner kindness teacher, and we see that there's nothing to it. It is unfounded. And, and so the whole strategy of the ego is to keep us so busy firefighting and doing stuff in the world and staying so busy repairing the dream, got my dream repair technician hat on again, uh, that you know, we, we never stop to look at the contents of our mind. And yet, once we do look at the mind and see the thing that the ego trembles to, that we would dare to look at, the, the unconscious guilt, we see there's nothing there. It's unfounded, unfounded. And now it's conscious because we have this wonderful classroom that all the metaphors and symbols that we call the people and events and circumstances in our lives represent come back to us on that silver platter to give us exactly the forgiveness classroom we need moment to moment to undo that. Isn't that nice? Isn't that a lot to be grateful for? Yeah. We can afford to be grateful for everyone 
whether it's a call for love or an expression of love. It doesn't matter. It's always the same response. So here's, here's the, the, the actual uh, phrase here. It is this quick forgetting of the parts you play in, in making your, quote, reality that makes defenses seem to be beyond your own control. But what you have forgot can be remembered, given willingness to reconsider the decision, which is doubly shielded by oblivion. And there's the two shields, the guilt, and then the individuality, space, and time that is the, the outer shield. You're not remembering is but the sign that the, this decision still remains in force as far as your desires are concerned. Concern. Mistake not this for fact. Defenses must make facts unrecognizable. They aim at doing this, and it is this they do. <laughs> so, our defense against the truth. So yeah, it was basically to keep us from looking at the unconscious guilt because then we would see that it's unfounded and then it would disappear. And we just talked about that. So, um, another question. On the level of form, we're all different, but form is a disguise. There is nothing so blinding as perception of form. Form blinds us. It blinds us to the mind. It blinds us to the guilt that is behind the form as guilt blinds us to the love that's behind the guilt. And that's the beauty of, of that, that uh, real alternative section where it says, you know, yeah, knock yourself off out if you want to, you know, try all the, all the, all the alternatives, you know, to peace. But the real alternative will be patiently waiting there, like the Maytag repairman, you know, ready for when, whenever you're ready. The Holy Spirit just calmly waits. You know, I'll be there. You know, <laughs> whenever you're ready. So, uh, I'm skip that too. And how much time do we have? I, I, I was going to set a timer for myself. I forgot to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll let you go till about two twenty. Two twenty. Okay, good. I think I'm about right then. Um, so I think I think the beauty of a course in miracles it teaches by contrast, and it, we get to. Have you ever noticed when you're reading through the course that Jesus will take um, just a scathing expose of the ego, but not in any kind of bitter way. It's just kind of like looking very factually at how dysfunctional it is. And then contrast it by the, the same thought system that, that the Holy Spirit represents, and you put them side by side, it's like, why would I choose the, the same one? <laughs> well, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, so the Holy Spirit gently, you know, slowly but surely exposes the horrific, meaningless ego illusion of a separate self with separate interests, and, and we kind of like drain the swamp. It's like it's there all the time. And I think sometimes you often hear people talk about how um, you know, there's more craziness in the world. Well, I think that's kind of a, a symbolic of the fact that we're being more sensitive and more alert to the fact that the insanity of our egos has always been there. But we're just kind of draining the swamp and seeing the, <laughs> the desert, you know, this desert planet, you know. <laughs> it's just a whole lot of, you know, arid turf, you know, a place where starving and thirsty creatures come to die, you know, and yet, but that's just a hologram that we made up. And and another another favorite Ken quote is, you know, when you discover you're on, you know, uh, a desert, you know, what do you do? You leave. You leave the desert. You know? <laughs> I mean, why not? It's like, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so, you know, we just, we have to wait until we've had enough and we'll say, okay, I, that's good, you know. Time out, Finney's done, I'm good. I mean, I think, you know, when we do that for the last time, that's, you know, God takes the final step, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's a hellish but empty imaginary oblivion. It's not real at all. But, but we sure make it real, don't we? You know, I like Richard Bach's phrase, you know, Warner Brothers Worlds, MGM Lifetimes, you know, we're, we're in a, a dramatic production with production values that are, that it, Craig can relate to this because you do post-production work. You, you, you put a lot into, you know, making the videos so real. And so, so, you know, authentic looking. And wow, you know, you pinch your arm or, or stub your toe or, or, you know, do things in the world. And boy, it seems solid. It seems real. Award winning. Beyond Academy Award winning. <laughs> but, it, but, it's, but it's just a show. So, and we forgot to laugh at it. So the TMI, you know, could be too much misinformation as well as a tiny man idea. Here's another, another favorite uh, uh, pun from Steve uh, Behrman, a.k.a. Swami Beyond Ananda. He says, we're all suffering from irregular hilarity. <laughs> it's a 
digestive dysfunction. <laughs> so Holy Spirit re reminds us to not take ego's nonsense seriously in terms of its, and it's an identity agenda. It's, it's, it's all about, you know, trying to get us to identify with the self that we made up that it just isn't working out for us. So um, there's, I'll just read this. As Ken Wapping says, the ego isn't sinful or evil or wicked. It's just silly and completely forgivable. But he does remind us that we have to look at it with our inner kindness teacher, the J or Jesus or the Holy Spirit of the Course, in order to dis dispel its seeming hold on our minds. It's all about the decision maker in the mind. And that's really the beauty and the, the wonderful part of it is, is that's where we get back to um, that choice. That's where the real freedom is in the mind. Throughout A Course in Miracles, Jesus pokes ever so gentle fun at our ever so silly investment in a non-existent identity. It's maladaptive solution, the outer shield of oblivion, projected nightmare multiverse of space, time, and individuality to the non-existent problem, which is the inner shield of oblivion, the insane thought system of sin, guilt, fear, death, cruelty, and specialness. So I, I, this, this is the, the uh, place where I, I put together a bunch of quotes that I pulled, that, that I put little smiley faces in, in my book as I was going through over the last year. But I, I, I started to you know, detect a little humor there. So, and this, this to me is a really good preface to it because one of Ken Wapnick's audios is called Taking the Ego Lightly, Protecting Our Projections. And this is a quote that I transcribed from the audio. And he says this with this kind of little impish voice. So if you can, I'll try to paraphrase, try to capture this. There's this little man, very sweet, very gentle. And he keeps tapping us and saying, come listen to me. This is not what you think. So let me tell you a very funny story. We don't want to hear a funny story. He says, you got to hear this. It's really cute. It's sweet. <laughs> it's funny. It will make you laugh. We respond, I'm not letting go of my anger, my grievance, my pain, my suffering. My memories are my specialists. He waits and waits and waits. He's always smiling sweetly. Gently, tenderly, kindly. That's what forgiveness means. You don't take things personally. You don't let things upset you. How could a world of total unreality upset you? Unless you had an investment in the world of total unreality being reality. So, okay. I just, I, the way Ken shares this, and you, you really get the idea. It, it, it comes across, it's like, it really, we. we this is a silly joke. It's just, it's laughable from above the battleground. And he's gently leading us to that, that, to that place. So, so these are some examples of, I think, where, where Jay is parodying, parodying, making a parody of the ego in, in, in the text here. I'm just going to read, the, how much time do we have now? About 10 minutes? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read the bold face uh, portions here. Um, it says, you are capable of enormous procrastination. <laughs> yeah, like how many lifetimes? And then, well, not now, the, the last sentence. Eventually, everyone begins to recognize, however dimly, <laughs> that there must be a better way. Do I have a bill? <laughs> okay. Uh, the confusion between your real creation and what you have made of yourself is so profound that it has literally become impossible for you to know anything. <laughs> I think he's kind of limping. I kind of like to think of, of Jesus as like the most infinitely benevolent, kind version of Rodney Dangerfield. Or, 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 you know, one of those kind of comics, you know, that, that lampoons, you know. You, know. <laughs> you have no idea of the tremendous release and deep peace. <laughs> From, it comes from meeting yourself and your brothers totally without judgment. But I like that you have no idea part. That, that, that he's kind of saying, your ego is clueless. <laughs> Oops, hey, you've, you've forgotten already. It's been five seconds since I reminded you. <laughs> That's okay. You know? We need, like, like Gary's teachers say, we need reminders. We need repetitions. A good thing is required. Their meaning is lost to you precisely because you are judging them. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. When we judge our brothers, we, we forget the lesson. As long as we're, we're getting on the condemnation bandwagon, no matter how subtly, we're losing the gift of that present moment, that, that tremendous gift that, that is being offered to us from our, the people on our inner theatrical payroll. 
because everybody's on our theatrical payroll. We don't remember signing the, the, the bottom of every page of our, our, our script, but our signature's there in the virtual space. The strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. It is curious that an ability so ability so debilitating would be so deeply cherished. <laughs> Yet if you wish to be the author of reality, you, uh, uh, you will insist on holding on to judgment. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Ego's reasoning is total confusion about everything. <laughs> he doesn't mince any words here, does he? No, I don't think so. If you want to be like me, I will help you, knowing that we are alike. If you want to be different, I will wait, let me take your pair again, until you change your mind. He's not going anywhere. Where is there to go? There's no space and time, or individuality, or guilt. You might well ask how the voice of something that does not exist can be so insistent. <laughs> I think there's a lot of humor in the question. <laughs> what you have made is so unworthy of you that you could hardly want it if you were willing to see it as it is. To deny is to not know. Ask him, therefore, what God's will is for you, and he will tell you yours. It cannot be too often repeated that you do not know it. <laughs> The case for insanity is strong to the insane. <laughs> if I had time, I'd read the, the whole paragraph because you put it in an even more profound context. But these are, I think, just even isolated, they're pretty good. Seek and do not find. Try to learn, but do not succeed. <laughs> the ego's maxim, right? If you're trying to learn how not to learn, and the aim of your teaching is to defeat itself, what can you expect but confusion? <laughs> this attempt at learning has so weakened your mind that you cannot love, for the curriculum you have chosen is against love and amounts to a course on how to attack yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you who have tried to learn what you do not want should take heart, for although the curriculum you set yourself is depressing indeed, it is merely ridiculous if you look at it. It's not... Evil, sinful, wicked, it's just silly, just silly. Resign now as your own teacher. <laughs> this resignation will not lead to depression. <laughs> <laughs> you, who cannot even control yourself, should hardly aspire to control the universe. <laughs> but look upon what you have made of it and rejoice that it is not so. <laughs> I mean, what a relief! You know, when we when we get out of the driver's seat and let Jay, you know, sit there, it's it's actually very it's quite a relief, isn't it? Under the circumstances, would it not be more desirable to have been wrong, even apart from the fact that you were wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the insane relate to their insane world. <laughs> Our little Whoville kingdom. They communicate with those who are not there. <laughs> Projection makes perception. You who are steadfastly devoted to misery must first recognize that you are miserable and not happy. You believe that misery is happiness. You have undertaken to learn what you can to learn to do, what you can never do, believing that unless you learn unless you learn it, you will not be happy. Muy <laughs> loco. Have faith in nothing, and you will find the treasure that you seek. You will believe that nothing is of value, and will value it. You have believed that nothing can be precious. Do I, do I feel a golem impersonation coming out? Smeagol. Yeah. My precious. You have believed that nothing could content you. And that, that's all the roads that lead nowhere that that real alternative section talks about. And yet, just beyond that, just beyond the special love and beyond the special hate is the real love. And it's just waiting there, just patiently waiting there. Only the blind and deaf could fail to see and hear them. You have so little faith in what you heard because you have preferred to place still greater faith in the disaster you have made. <laughs> 
No mince words there, huh? <laughs> but, it's, but it's a dream disaster. That's the best part. And I, and I underline this part. Reality is safe and sure and wholly kind to everyone and everything. That's our way out. When we remember to be wholly kind to everyone and everything. Because why wouldn't we treat what's on the screen with, with gentle tenderness? Because why, why, why beat up on, on a projection of our own mind? Let not the dream take hold to close your eyes. It is not... Is it not strange? Oh it, oh, it is not strange that dreams can make a world that is unreal. It is the wish to make it that is incredible. You make it difficult. Well, here, here's one of the real clinchers. It is not personally insulting that your contribution and the Holy Spirit's are so extremely disproportionate. You are still convinced that your understanding is a powerful contribution to the truth and makes it what it is. Isn't that great? Yeah. The ego rules and cruelly. To defend this little speck of dust, it bids you fight against the universe. In its amazing arrogance, this tiny sunbeam has decided it is the sun. This almost imperceptible ripple hails itself as the ocean. Think how alone and frightened is this little thought this infinitesimal illusion holding itself apart against the universe. The sun becomes the sunbeam's enemy that would devour it, and the ocean terrifies the little ripple that, and wants to swallow it. Only a little wall of dust still stands between you and your brother. That little bit of unforgiveness, a little bit of condemnation, just silly stuff, inconsequential stuff. Blow on it lightly and with happy laughter, and it will fall away. Oh, and I put this one just because I like Monty Python. Something completely different. <laughs> that's all. That's all it was. <laughs> but was Monty Python inspired by the Course or vice versa? I don't know. <laughs> okay, and then here's the you know, classic one. The first obstacle to peace. The first obstacle to peace must flow across is your desire to get rid of it. <laughs> Evidence of a crazy thought system. You have listened to what can never communicate at all. Denying what you are and firm in faith that you are something else, this something else, in quotes, that you have made to become your, made to be yourself becomes your sight. Yet it must be the something else that sees and as not you explains its sight to you. So it's our, our own egos blind leading the mind. You would maintain and think it true that you do not believe these senseless laws nor act upon them. And when you look at what they say, they cannot be believed. Brother, you do believe them. For how else could you perceive the form they take with content such as this? And that's, that's where, you know, it takes sometimes courage to, you know, get the process going to reel back in those projections and say, this is not about anyone else. It's about my mind. It's about my unconscious guilt. But I'm not going to see that it's unfounded until I reel it in, put it on the altar, Look at it with Holy Spirit and see that it was nothing to it. There was nothing there. I'm going to go to the next one. The tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Together we can laugh them both away and understand that time cannot intrude upon eternity. It is a joke, a joke to think that time can come to circumvent eternity. And then this classic, of course. Remember nothing you, were, you taught yourself, or you were badly taught. <laughs> <laughs> Seek now out, outside yourself. For it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. Our special, most idols that we make. Yeah. Seek not outside yourself. For Speaking of repetition, right? For all your pain comes simply from a futile search for what you want, insisting where it must be found. What if it's not there? Do you prefer you, that you be right or happy? Seek not to seek for it outside yourself. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a two, one of two states. We get to choose one or the other at any given moment. No one who understands what you have learned, how carefully you learned it, and the pains to which you went to practice and repeat the lessons endlessly in every form you could conceive of them, could ever doubt the power of your learning skill. <laughs> and I think that's where, in the section on, on cause and effect, Jesus says, you know, I don't want to you know, diminish the power of your mind because you made up a whole universe to hide from a maladaptive 
you know, pro, you know, a non-existent problem. You made up this whole massive colossal dream to hide out as a fugitive from ego's god, which was made up, who was going to destroy you for destroying, you know, the real god, which you never did. Like, <laughs> what happened? Here? Think not that happiness is ever found by following a road away from it. <laughs> Let me repeat that to achieve a goal, you must proceed in its direction, <laughs> not away from it. <laughs> I think there's another place where, where uh, I'm not sure if it's the, where, where, where uh, you know, Jesus is telling Helen, you know, that, that you, know, you, you actually have to try practicing this, you know, in order for it to work. And then he says, a sorry concept of yourself. You are too confused about yourself. And then, uh, just, to, I'm almost done, there's just a couple more. Uh, in the workbook, I do not know what anything is for. Um, it's, it's meaningless to us, because we don't know what it's for. If you are trusting in your own strength, you have every reason to be apprehensive, anxious, and <laughs> Yeah. Duh. What can you predict or control? What is there in you that can be counted on? <laughs> you know, if, if we're a little if speck on a Whoville planet, you know, we're thinking we're a Who instead of the what we all are, that's pretty frightening, you know? I mean, you know, we can understand, we can have compassion for each other when we, we tremble with that, that fraudulent identity. And uh, I, I put the JFO phrase on, on uh, I, I love the... the, uh, the I don't know what JFO means. Oh, just another forgiveness opportunity. That's, that's from uh, one of Gary's books. Is that your moral rally? I think it is. Yeah. Anyway. Because everything really is seen from above the battleground. Just another forgiveness opportunity. Just another moment where we can be, practice our kindness lessons, reel back in our projections, see that that perfect oneness wasn't shattered. We didn't, you know, miss a note in heaven's song. That what we really are is one perfect, innocent, beautiful, incredible, all of spirit being was was never can possibly be dimmed or distorted or deleted in, in, in its infinite purity and, and wholeness. According to this, now back now back to the, the lamp journey, just a couple more. Uh, according to this insane plan, any perceived source, source of salvation is acceptable, provided that it will not work. <laughs> uh, the illusion persists that although this hope has always failed, there is still grounds for hope in other places and in other things. <laughs> Maybe we'll get somebody else other than Lucy to hold the football this year. Right? <laughs> Another person will serve better. Another situation will yet offer success. And this is from the, I, I will step back and let him lead the way. Uh, I says, you know, I mean, once we start realizing that, that our, our uh, little individual plan isn't working out so well, you know, we, we smile more frequently. It's just like, well, I know my, my plan isn't going to work, so if I, I kind of once in a while remember to, to not invest so heavily in that identity, I think I can actually afford to be more peaceful. So why not? And then, uh, oh, this is, this, I, I'll, I'll finish with this one because I, I think this is one of the most beautifully uh, off the hook letting, is that a different phrase? Yes. I just made it up. Um, <laughs> phrases in the whole, the whole, uh, whole three volumes. Uh, in order to judge anything rightly, one would have to be fully aware of an inconceivably wide range of things, past, present, and to come. One would have to recognize in advance all the effects of his judgment on everyone and everything involved in them in, in any way. And one would have to be certain that there is no distortion in his perception, so that his judgment would be wholly fair to everyone on whom it rests now and in the future. Who is in a position to do this? Who except in grandiose fantasies would claim this for himself? So, oh, I guess there was one more. Ask yourself what, whether your judgment of the Word of God is more likely to be true. Let's see, which one's more likely to be true? I wonder. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. This is how you get a hold of me. I, I have a website called ACM Blog, and uh, I do a lot of stuff on Facebook, and uh, you can email me and do a lot of stuff online. And so, anyway, thank you so much, and thanks to everyone. Let's take a round of applause.